Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, it's wonderful. We get to do one of our listeners' absolute favorite shows today when we talk about how everything is terrible at Michigan. I, we're, we are all about audience service, and we know what you want to hear. And friends, I think the show is going to deliver. I, it does seem like we are doing a lot of these shows. I don't know if that's us or if that's Michigan. There's a lot to talk about, specifically because they're talking about so little, and the little bits that are coming out are like, well, they, they've stopped using soccer balls during practice, so that's good. So there's, they're real progress. They're using the footballs with the pointy ends now, so this is, this is really good. The program's come a long way in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, they finally figured out the push-pull of the door, mm-hmm. so they were able to actually practice, but then they'd lock the doors and wouldn't let anybody else in or anybody out. So I'm sure the learning has been great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, typically, typically when you want to hide everything, it's because everything's going great, and you <laughs> definitely don't want to show anyone that uh, anything. You know, we don't want to embarrass anyone else because things are a little too good here right now. That's that's, that's my that's my guess. True, you don't want to brag, and that that's what this is. Michigan shutting out the entire media and fans from their spring practices. Uh, it's just because they don't want to brag. Who's got it better than us? Well, we don't want to say because we don't want anyone else to feel bad about the fact sure. that they might not have it better than us. Those who stay will just, you know, you don't have to talk about it. We don't want to need to tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> All right. We don't want to brag. We don't want to be show offs. Yes. The, uh, you know, the, the uh, like middle of the pack and like, okay, you know, hail, hail to Michigan, the, the middle of the pack and okay. <laughs> it's very, a very humble football program. Just not wanting to be flashy. We're we're in a pandemic. They're not trying to just show everybody what they've got. It's hard times for everybody. We're all struggling. The last thing uh, Michigan is is going to want to do is uh, like showcase some sort of arrogance. That's not what Michigan does. Am I wrong? (laughs) You must be new here, friends. (laughs) So we are going to talk about Michigan a little bit today. And then... uh, and just just see what happens who knows where the show is going to go but the reason we're talking about michigan is because their their spring camp is now over media i'm trying to find out what happened at, in at michigan this spring for like you and me is you know we google and we read what other people are saying or you go to mgo blog and then what, what are people saying and the people who cover the team they're like well this is what we're hearing because we haven't seen anything. And so they're hearing stuff from inside the program, which should usually be like, uh, you know, sugar and roses, but it's not necessarily that case. So like even inside the program, it sounds like people are going like, I mean, in, in fairness, Michigan, I think, has only been to the Sugar Bowl once in the last uh, 20 years, and they haven't been to the Rose Bowl at all in about 15 years. So the Sugar and Roses is not really the expectation there at this point. It's more uh, like uh, pizza uh, and oil uh, changes. Uh, I was say, yeah, out- Outbacks and uh, <laughs> and tax slaying. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, taxes. Taxes is definitely being slain in Michigan right now, for sure. Uh, yeah, it, it is. You, you always, you know, I think we have a pretty good sense for which Ohio State coaches are more likely to just say stuff and have it just be like, hey, you're, you're saying nice stuff about people and how, which Ohio State coaches are ones who are going to be a little bit more straight shooters. You didn't get the sense that anyone in Michigan, I mean, if, if the coaches at Michigan are uh, being sunshine pumpers, like, boy, oh, boy, if, uh, if this is the positive spin on things, like, oh, boy, this is... Ugh. It's not not going to be a super fantastic season, and you know, coming off of a two and four year where it was like it was like a two and four year that was not quite as inspiring as a you know the two and four record might have suggested because one of the two wins was what triple overtime against Rutgers, like not fantastic. So it was it was like week one against Minnesota, everyone did the uh, chest pounding. Michigan is back, and you you know you can go back and find. Uh, I saw someone, I think it was one of those barstool people saying. Uh, Joe Milton greater greater than uh, Justin Field. It's like oh that one aged well. That that worked out great. Yes, sir. That's uh, that is a thing you can type on the internet. That was week one against Minnesota, and then it was like after that. Well, they had a triple overtime win against Rutgers, and then they didn't lose to Ohio State. Those I think were the three highlights of the season for them. Well, you say what you want about Joe Milton comparing him to Justin Fields, 
now that he's at Tennessee, uh, Milton has a chance to be a starting SEC quarterback, which is something that Justin Fields never could be. Mm, so that's that's true. That's true. I I I take it all back. Thank you. So the thing with the Michigan Spring, like all of the information basically came out. It comes out like I don't know weekly through John Jansen's podcast, which is run by Michigan's athletic department. John Jansen, a former All American offensive lineman for Michigan. Uh, so it would be like. Tom, if we were covering Ohio State and the only only access we had to coaches or players was to listen to Jim Lachey's podcast. And no offense to Jim Lachey, he's he's great doing what he does, but like if that's the only access you have to the coaches, and so then it becomes this thing where, well, now now I have to listen to every single podcast because that's the only place I'm gonna get information and I can't ask any questions. And now I've got a report on what was said. And it's like, well, how much reporting do you do on what was said? How much reporting do you do on reading between the lines? Uh, and when you're, you're fed stuff, you also have to then like, fed stuff from like this type of medium. Then you also have to, you know what? I'm going to seek out my own information and I'm going to report my own information because I, I just can't can't with the state run media stuff. And so it just, it lends itself to seeking out other avenues of gaining information, which goes on regardless, but it doesn't always, the reporting doesn't always happen. You know what I'm saying, Tom? So like this just lends itself to, you're trying to keep everything a secret. It lends itself to secrets coming out. Exactly. This is this is uh, the old information wants to be free. Like that's fine. You can you can try and keep everything bottled up. And I think every every college football program does that to some degree or another. Michigan is like at the absolute far end of that spectrum, where nothing is coming out. You know, this is this is like the uh, Manhattan Project up uh, up in Ann Arbor, where um, well, that's not a great example because the Manhattan Project didn't produce many duds, but. It, you know, it, everything is everything is uh, super secret, and and you can't can't let anyone find out anything because if someone finds out that you know this guy is running with the second team now, like well, that will ruin the entire season. Like I don't think that's that actually that big a deal. But so then you you get to the why at that point, and then a lot of the a lot of the people writing about Michigan right now are the interpretation is not they're not letting us in because everything's looking a little too good. It's uh hey, we don't want anyone to come in and say hey. These people don't look like they've played football before. That seems like that's a problem. And, you know, this is this is transition spring for Michigan where they've got it to new. They've basically completely turned over the defensive side of the ball. You've got, you know, a quarterback situation that's kind of a mess. You've got some young guys coming in where, you know, can J.J. McCarthy win the starting job? Can Donovan Edwards win the starting running back job? That kind of stuff. You know, there's some promising young talent, but promising young talent doesn't generally look fantastic in their first spring. Like, that's just not a... You know, you're, you're going to have a learning curve there. So, like, I get that you don't want to put those guys in a bad spot, but also, like, mm, you you have zero excitement around the program right now after last season. You're not letting anyone in. You're not giving anyone anything to be excited about. You know, your spring game highlights were, like, a minute 17 of closely tight shot, closely edited, color-treated video. Like, that's not going to get anyone excited about this season. And you know, for, for a program that, you know, cherishes its hundred thousand seat, uh, sellout streak and all that kind of stuff. Like you are not setting your fan base up to be excited for this season at all. And, you know, if you get off to a slow start, like it, it could get real, real bad because this, you know, he, he has done the, you know, he has turned over both of his coordinator positions in the last couple of years. And, you know, with the, with his contract, the way it is, this sure seems like a do or die season for him. So yeah, it, it, I mean, this is, it just does not seem like it's shaping up to be a good, a good year for Michigan. No. And, but being college sports, there is a renewal each year of, of hope and even for Michigan, but it's, we, we've talked about the lack of energy from players and, and how that reflects they're they're reflecting Jim Harbaugh. And then, so when we did hear from some Michigan players, I think in the winter about the new coaches and how much they loved them because they brought so much energy. So there, there is that, that kind of uh, rebirth of hope, but then it's still attached to Jim Harbaugh. And you're, you're talking, and, and the fan base, and you read some of the message boards, and, and while message boards are not the best guide for the bigger picture, 
it's a pretty good indication of where the rabid fan base is and they're not they have like zero expectations for for michigan this year and nothing they saw this spring changed that because tom they saw nothing this spring and all they heard was you know this guy's not looking great or there there's there, there's so many changes going on that i'm sure they can't put a, a solid product out in the spring no no coach is happy with what they put out in the spring but you still generally allow some access in terms of talking to coaches players and, uh, and we saw we didn't see much from ohio state we saw got to see portions of three practices and a spring game and uh, we were we would have liked much more than that but imagine covering michigan where there's there's nothing and and you just have to rely on a, a former players podcast a- asking questions from a michigan perspective about this and that and then and then that's that's your job now and so it's and and to entice readers because your job is actually to you know provide information to your readers and uh, when that information is diluted and uh, cleaned up and presented in such a way like it it's um it's hard to get excited as a fan when this is the what you're being fed it, it i think this is a a great opportunity for everyone to learn the difference between journalism and pr pr is you know this is what we want you to know and journalism is like reporting what you see and sometimes you see stuff that is good and sometimes you see stuff that is bad and you know you're not ever from the official team site going to get like yeah this guy does not look like he's ready for prime time like this you know hey this is this position is going to be a problem you, you get the um you know I, re- I remember the was the uh 2018 when ryan day was the interim coach and there was you know they they we instead of getting the interview day we just got like a list of quotes on all these different positions and it was you know all the you know all these positions hey this is encouraging hey this is encouraging hey this is encouraging and i think it was the linebackers there was one that was just like they're continuing to work and it was like oh okay let me translate that for you this is a huge flaming tire fire right now and we weren't there to see it and we weren't there to ask the questions but you can kind of read between the lines and you know if you're just getting that it's like okay you're getting the most positive spin on it that you could possibly get. And, you know, you, you get there, there is uh, I think there is a generally a trend in all media, you know, sports media, especially for teams to, you know, try and control as much of the media as they can and not, you know, restrict access to outside media, do more stuff inside. That's just, you know, that is not just a college football thing. That is a professional sports team, you know, English Premier League soccer teams have been like really bad about that. And, you know, you're probably doing a little bit of a disservice to your fans. Like, I don't feel like there's, uh, I don't think the Ohio State football beat is like a particularly brutal beat in terms of like terrible, horrible probing, uh, you know, questions that are really going to get everyone and, you know, get people angry. It, it is not a, uh, you know, but, but it's also an independent, uh, an independent beat. If you were, if you're just like pumping out sunshine to your readers, all the, you know, and viewers all the time, like at some point people figure that out, like, Hey, this is not, you know, this is just what they want me to see. This is not actually necessarily a, refl- a reflection of, uh, you know, of, of the reality on the ground. And again, going back to the information wants to be free. That's when you get the people with the insider sources saying, okay, now, and now, and when they say all three quarterbacks are still battling for the job, here's what's really happening. And, you know, that, that people know stuff, people like to talk. And so that information does eventually get out. And, um, you know, there's, there is, uh, you know, you can, you can do as much as you want to, to try and like lock down the outside access, but eventually that stuff, you know, that, that stuff does get out because people want to know and, if people want to know and there's a market for it, people will find a way to make it happen. Well, and you also have uh, like schools allow former players to come in and just, you know, watch practice and things like that. I don't know how much Michigan restricts that, but that's something also where if you've got like angry alums who are watching practice, like they're going to come out and, and tell reporters or whatever, like what, what they've seen because they're tired of it. Like they, they're tired of what they're watching. This is not my Michigan. This is not the, nine and three that I was when I was in school. This is like a seven and five team. How dare they? 
And so they're going to share their frustration with, with some reporters. And then uh, that, that's also how some information comes out. And then, of course, then you report that things aren't looking great. And now, now you're even angrier. Now, now the, uh, the school is even angrier. Things get shut down even more. And so <laughs> it's just this, uh, it, it's a process that fights itself when just if you open it up a little bit more, people are going to talk about what you're, what they're going to talk about what players are saying and players are saying good things because they're excited. So now you now you have dozens of reporters writing about the excitement of Michigan because players are excited Mm -hmm. and now fans can get excited. But when you provide nothing now, then, then the hand wringing and then the, well, well, why? And then, well, I heard, and then, Oh yeah, well that goes with what I heard. And, and then you combine that with what the coaches are actually saying with, uh, let's talk a little bit about, Quarterback coach Matt Weiss, who uh, was on, I, I believe it was John Jansen's podcast, and was asked about the quarterbacks. They've got three on scholarship right now: Cade McNamara, Dan Valari, and JJ McCarthy, the freshman. Dan Valari, we have talked about many times on this show as a guy who uh, had to replace a, another Michigan quarterback commit who had to retire from football. So he was, I don't know, Dartmouth or something. Fordham, I believe. He, he was a two-star guy from Long Island who was, you know, going to an FCS school, and then Michigan got super, super late in the process in the 2000 December, like 2019, I think. Uh, went, oh crap, we need another quarterback because our old guy uh, has a heart condition, has to medically retire, and um, found found Dan Valari on uh, on Long Island, and you know, I think he is a uh, about as break glass in case of emergency quarterback as you can possibly have. And he was potentially in line to be the guy who started at Ohio State last fall, which probably would not have gone super fantastic. No, Tom. No, it wouldn't have. And he probably would have had very little do, to do with Ohio State putting up 77 points or whatever, but he probably, he probably would have contributed at least to pick six, if not two. But, uh, so let's, uh, let's discuss, because the thing that stood out to me most is what uh, Weiss had to say about Cade McNamara, who I believe is – Retro sophomore started a few games last year. Uh, I I forget exactly how many. Like Joe Milton started, Cade McNamara started because it was it was all a mess. Well, jo- Joe Milton was the savior at the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. So what normally would have been the September Heisman winner was actually the October Heisman winner last Correct. year. And then McNamara came in. I think was during the Rutgers game, and because they were down like seventeen points real early to Rutgers, and uh, you know anytime you can pull out a miraculous triple overtime win on the road at Rutgers you know that's that is greatness ahoy so he was he was the late season savior last year which means he's now heads into spring as the as the savior will have two to three games of savior type play in the beginning of the season and then it'll fall apart and then jj mccarthy will become the new savior and the circle of life continues same as it ever was so kid mcnamara who is i don't know i don't even know what he's listening at like six one two oh five something like that that sounds Maybe. like a guess yeah ish but, it does sound like a guess. You're right. <laughs> so, so Weiss, here's, here's what, what Weiss has to say about him. You can say he's not enough of this or not enough of that, but at the end of the day, he's really smart. He makes great decisions. He processes things very fast, and his accuracy and arm strength are more than enough to win with. Tom, what does, uh, what is Matt Weiss really saying there? Matt Weiss is saying, what does he look like? He's got a great personality. That's that's uh, that's more or less it. Like, well, he's um, he, he's what we have right now, and uh, of all the things we have right now, he is one of them. And um, you know, there were I mean, some of those reports that came out that were just kind of like the uh, whispered reports to Michigan sites were like, hey, there were a lot of passes getting batted down at the line of scrimmage, which is probably not super fantastic for the offensive line. It's probably not super fantastic for the quarterbacks. And when it's like a lot of passes getting batted down from the scrimmage, like Ohio State had a few in their spring game, like these things happen. It's a mishmash. But if that's like, oh, this is just like not a functional offense, like, okay, that's like, that's a problem because this is, this is not Josh Gat. You know, the defense was the one that's supposed to be really just a complete mishmash and a brand new staff and a brand new system. And, the, you know, the offense should have probably been cutting this defense to ribbons in the spring. And if it wasn't, like, that's not fantastic. That's a, that's a, that has to be a huge concern. And this is a quarterback going against a defensive line that doesn't have a lot of defensive linemen. So, mm-hmm. and the talent isn't necessarily there. So now imagine that against an actual defensive line that is rushing the passer to, to hit the guy rather than just rushing the passer to try and uh, just get some reps in. So 
yeah, to me, like he, I am going to say he's not enough of this or not <laughs> enough of that. And that's, that takes me back to the conversation we had at the end of the last show with the game manager. Ohio State can't even go as far as they want with a game manager. This is exactly what you say of a game manager with what Weiss said of McNamara. So, Tom, how far can Michigan go with a game manager as I, I pull up their schedule? And, again, here's my, here's my prediction of what's going to happen for the quarterbacks at Michigan. Dave McNamara is going to start a few games. He's going to get hurt. Then J.J. McCarthy, he'll, he'll get hurt or get benched. Then J.J. No, he'll get benched. That's right. Because I'm trying to ex- remember exactly how it's going to happen. He will get benched. J.J. McCarthy will come in, you know, in the second half of one game or whatever and do the, the Rutgers triple overtime thing. Start a couple of games. He'll get hurt. Then it's Alan Bowman's turn, the transfer from Texas Tech, who arrives in June, I believe. So then he'll get a couple of starts. And then he'll eventually either get hurt or get benched. And then it goes back to Cade McNamara to finish out the season. And uh, I'm just wondering, Tom, as you, I don't know if you've pulled up their schedule, but a game manager needs so much around him. And Michigan has some stuff around him. I'm concerned about the offensive line. I think they have decent. receivers that he can get the ball to them. I think uh, they have too many slot receivers and Ronnie Bell's maybe not an actual outside receiver to where he could be reliable. I like Cornelius Johnson, what he did last year coming on outside, but you know, and, and we'll see what Donovan Edwards does as running back. I, I like Hassan Haskins. I don't know that he's more than what he already has been. I don't think he's special, uh, but it, 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 he's something. Uh, so, I don't think the skill is there to be a game manager and win more than seven games. I, I mean, if if he's if the quarterback play is just consistent and decent, you know, you're you're not, you know, you're throwing mm. uh, twelve touchdowns and seven interceptions. Like you're not superstar, but you're not killing the team. Seven games or so. I don't know if they're going to get that this year because I I don't know what McNamara really is going to be. And if you go to McCarthy, like you just have to build in a learn, you have to build in a learning curve. And the question, the really interesting question with McCarthy is, okay, let's say he's the best quarterback on the roster in terms of at least at talent. Does Jim Harbaugh feel he has the ability to? play a true freshman if he's his job is on the line this year. I mean, you, you've got a little bit of a moral hazard issue there where what's best for Jim Harbaugh might not be best for what's best for the program. If Jim Harbaugh feels like he's coaching for his life and they're three and three after their first six games, which is Western Michigan, Washington, NIU, Rutgers, at Wisconsin, at Nebraska, say they're three and three at that point. You got you got a bye week at that point. That would be a very natural point to say, okay, listen, this is not going to be a championship season. We got to start developing for the future. Does Jim Harbaugh then go to Alan Bowman? Because it's like, well, this is, we got to, we have to win now. Because if we don't win now, it's someone else's program next year. Because right after that break, they go to Northwestern, home for Northwestern at Michigan State, home for Indiana at Penn State, at Maryland, Ohio State. Like the back half of that schedule is nasty. I don't know. I don't know if I see a seven and five season. Here, unless they get like, unless JJ McCarthy or Cade McNamara or Alan Bowman is like pretty good as a quarterback, like I'm not asking for you know 40 touchdowns and three interceptions like Justin Fields had a couple of years ago, but 28 touchdowns and five interceptions, 28 touchdowns and six interceptions, something like that. Like if you're that, then sure, then you you may be a seven eight win team. I don't know that they're going to get that, and you know you, you're looking at. This this is a tough schedule. There are a lot of losable games in the schedule. There's not, they're not going to be massive underdogs against anyone probably outside of Ohio State. But you know, Washington losable game. Rutgers is potentially a losable game at home. I mean, if they lose to Rutgers, that's it. Like that is the end of the Jim Harbaugh era. At Wisconsin, losable, probably going to be a loss. At Nebraska, that's a losable game. Northwestern at home. Northwestern is Northwestern should be way down this year. Northwestern lost a lot, but that's a losable game. At Michigan State, we we saw last year, that's a losable game. Indiana at home, that's a losable game. At Penn State, that's probably going to be the, I would guess that'll be the uh, whiteout game. That's, you know, 
you want to send a true freshman into the whiteout game on the road with, you know, maybe equal talent, maybe like good luck at Maryland. That's a losable game. Mm -hmm. That is a game they could lose. And then Ohio state, like, I, I don't know, man, like this, it is entirely possible if this, if they get off to just a slow start, even if they're four and two at the break, like five and seven is like well within, within the realm of possibility for them this year. And if it's five and seven and they lose five of their last six games, like, go, go ahead and call a realtor because uh, it is it is probably time to move. Well, and, and the J.J. McCarthy thing, Ohio State has the same issue with, with Kyle McCord. And, and in terms of you start Kyle McCord, who, who do you say goodbye to? You're going to mm-hmm. say goodbye to somebody. So if at some point Michigan starts J.J. McCarthy, do they lose Cade McNamara? And now you're down to J.J. McCarthy and Dan Valari next year, and then some freshman that you signed. So there's danger in going to that, and it's it'll be interesting to see how Harbaugh weighs all of this, because I think obviously he wants to win now. And uh, but but then again, from the the reports we're hearing that others are hearing that is JJ McCarthy's not you know lighting it on fire. Yeah, he's got the arm strength and all of that. And I'll read what Weiss says here. Arm strength, mobility, great athlete, all that stuff is obvious as soon as you step on the field with him. But I've been even more impressed with his approach to things. His maturity is far beyond his years. And uh, that's all probably true. These quarterbacks nowadays are, I mean, they've been quarterbacks for seven, eight years by the, by the time they get to to college. So this is this is something they've always done. They have their all their own private coaches and academies and things like that. But there, there are accuracy issues and things, you know, things that others are hearing and that, that they're talking about. So, um, yeah, you can have some sort of a grasp as a freshman, but you're not going to have the necessary grasp in April that you're going to need in September, October, November. That's why it may be something that 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 six game by. It, I would be shocked if something doesn't happen there. Uh, but again, if Al- if um, Cade McNamara is just a game manager, that's better than what they've had. So maybe they go through those first six games, five and one. If if everything goes well, I don't see them winning at uh, I believe Wisconsin. I, I mm-hmm. think that's that's the the one that I don't think happens. And I think the others are winnable, but there are also two losable games in there. So say just being a game manager and not not losing the game, they go five and one. But then you look that back half, and I'm even three and three might be where I would top out for them with, with a guy who doesn't screw things up at quarterback. And to assume that they're going to have a guy who doesn't screw things up, I I think that's I don't think you can make that assumption. Uh, yeah, I mean that that I think is the best case scenario: five and one in the front half of the season, yeah. and then three and three at, at the back half. I mean, and if it's even if you do that, and it's the best case scenario, it's eight and four. And you're ending th- with three and three and the, you know, you lose at home to Ohio state by 14, 17, 21 points. I mean, what, what is the mood in Ann Arbor at that point? Like what, what are you, what are you selling to recruits at that point? It's like, I mean, w- what you have to sell is, well, it's going to be another year with this defense and they will be better because it's the second year with the defense. And uh, we have this quarterback, JJ McCarthy, who, you know, if he is, if they're eight and four, and if it's JJ McCarthy, you know, yes, it's going to get better because JJ McCarthy will be a sophomore next year. Jonathan Edwards will be a sophomore year next year. Like that's the argument for keeping him on. If you kind of end with a thud like that, the argument against that is you just at the end of last season basically kept him on solely because you, you know, you didn't, you know, you, you didn't want to move on. You weren't quite ready to move on. I just, I, I don't know if there's a scenario in which Michigan 2022 is better with Jim Harbaugh still kind of hanging around in the perpetual lame duck clay helton kind of status as compared to just like just pick up the phone and call matt campbell like it's just and if matt campbell says no like there are other guys you could bring in like it just it just that program just needs a, a sh- shot of energy more than anything else and like it's it's lovely that they think they have that now with this defensive coaching staff but that will last exactly till you know halftime of whatever game they're losing by 10 points and they run off the field getting booed by the fans and and then the energy is not there anymore and the fan base has checked out again and, you know, and, and then it's like, okay, well, 
we fired the, you know, we, we have a new offensive coordinator two years ago. We have a new defensive coordinator this year. Um, I'm out of coordinators to fire. So guess what happens then? Fire himself. Uh, he, he may not need to do it himself. He may have uh, someone else there to do it for him. Is my, is my speculation. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you look at the schedule and even if it's Cade McNamara who takes him to eight and four, I think you're going to see his peak this year because again, read what Y said. He's not this, he's not that. Uh, so he is limited. And then does he limit their offense and limit what they can do and limit who they can beat? Or you go to a, you look at JJ McCarthy who has more potential, certainly a higher ceiling can possibly take you further, but will we see any of that this year? And, and, because I, I think, um, who, who do you think is more likely to be that second quarterback? Do you think it's going to be Bowman or do you think it's going to be McCarthy or Dan Villari? You know, based on everything we saw out of that program this spring, I'm going to say, I'm going to grade that one incomplete. I think, I, I do think you, you it, it may depend a little bit on when it happens. Mm-hmm. You know, if this is the week two, Ooh. you know, how, how much can Alan Bowman get up to speed in the offense? You know, if Alan Bowman had been there this spring, I think the answer is Alan Bowman. And then you save J.J. McCarthy until, you know, mid-October or something like that and throw him in then during that bye week. But I, you know, if it's week two, I don't, you know, you're getting into the uh, 2008 Ohio State thing where it was like they they played one game, didn't look great, played a second game, got murdered at USC. And it was like, all right, well, this is very clearly not a national championship team. So they're just going to, you know, we're just going to throw in this freshman Terrell Pryor and just take our lumps and and i mean that first game against troy was like one of the most just horrendous ohio state games i've ever seen that they ended up winning you just kind of take your lumps and and go jim trestle had no concerns about his job security at that point off of a couple national championship seasons the standard was national championship seasons for michigan i mean what's what's the standard there like what what absolutely keeps jim harbaugh his job you know keeps jim harbaugh's job this year nine and three i mean like absolutely positively there's no way you know even if they lose by 100 points to ohio state if they're nine and three that's progress so therefore you can keep them i think he's safe at eight nine and nine and three i think i think he's probably safe at eight and four depending on how those four look that's they're ugly yeah yeah that's that's the thing if you lose to wisconsin early and then you somehow lose to Michigan State again. You know, I, I think if they lose to Mich- if they lose to Rutgers, he's fired almost no matter what. Outside of, uh, you know, I, I think the stipulation we're going to give here is if they beat Ohio State, almost no matter what else happens, he's, he keeps his job. Outside of beating Ohio State, if they lose to Rutgers, he's probably fired. You know, they, they will do the dignified Michigan pinky in the air. Oh, we shan't fire our coach in the middle of the season, but they'll be talking to people already at that point. If they lose to Michigan State, he's probably fired. You can't lose to a uh, Mel Tucker team two years in a row that's like just barely, barely fielding a competent team, and then you're going to lose to them twice in a row. Like you're probably fired at that point. If they lose, Indy, you know, you lose three games in the back half of that schedule before the Ohio State game, you're mm-hmm. probably fired. I mean, you you can't go in to the you can't go into the, another off season going well. Yes, we were seven and five, but we were also two and four in the back half of the schedule. If that does anything for you, it's it just there's just there's a lot of ways that I think this goes badly for them. And his buyout is his, the way his contract was restructured. My understanding is basically he was making eight million dollars a year before. Now he's, I think, making four million dollars a year and his buyout is four million dollars. So essentially firing him at the end of this season would have been exactly what it cost exactly as much as paying him under his old contract for, or, you know, for what this, this season would have been and uh, you know, and then paying him a $0 buyout. So it sure sets up like they are ready for a change. If they, you know, if there's any kind of excuse for a change, they're going to make a change this year. And I just, it sure feels to me like they're going to give, you know, he's going to give them an excuse to make a change. Do you think he's ready for a change? I've, I've felt like that for since, shoot, since the Amazon show. Like he's this, ready it, for something different. This just feels, it just looks like a bad marriage where they're, you know, they, they are very much not in love anymore and they're, you know, but they don't have anything better to do. So they're just kind of like continuing to continuing to not get divorced. Like that, that just seems like a program and a coach trapped in a loveless marriage, which you, you mean, you go back to what that program was in terms of excitement and energy when he first came in and then 
you get to the 2016 season and there's a near miss and it's like, okay, they're going to come back in 2017. They have the Amazon show and it's just like, eh, it just didn't look like they were enjoying life. Very, well, no, it was 2017. Yeah. Cause it was the yeah, Dwayne Haskins yeah, game. Yeah. 2017. Yeah. The show came out in 2018. That's what was throwing me off. I was like, then we talked about that more recently than that, but yeah, 2017 season. And just, yeah, the program just kind of looked dead. And then they come back in 2018, you have the revenge tour season and oh, it gosh. just, and you know, it, Oh, Michigan is back. Michigan is back and revenge tour. And then they come into Columbus and just get destroyed. And that was it. Like that was the, like the, the, the doctor has not pronounced the time of death yet on the Jim Harbaugh, uh, you know, the, the Jim Harbaugh era, but the, uh, the cause of death and the death certificate is going to be 62 to 39. Like that was, that was it. Like they, they have not come back from that. Like, you know, that you have these little flashes, these, you know, the, the patient in the coma has, you know, moved their finger. It's like, Oh, look, they, they beat Minnesota to open the season. Ah, everything is better. Like, mm, well, actually turns out it's not, they're still in a coma and uh, it's not, it's not looking real good right now. Some would say it's the 30 to 27 in 2016. That is that that's what did it, did him in. And you would think like, that's where things started to go squirrely with them. Uh, you know, he came in with all of this energy for two years. And then things kind of just, I don't know if you ever got over that. Not that you could, even though, I mean, science has shown JT Barrett picked up the first down. I mean, NASA has proven that. I'm not sure they've shared it, but it, it's been done. Uh, so, Tom, why exactly was, uh, was their spring game not broadcast? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, this is again, this is from the uh, Michigan state run media, the uh, John Jansen podcast. So um, the uh, Jansen, this is a quote, MGO blog uh, pulled all this stuff. They said, um, what, here's from Jansen regarding why fans and media were not allowed to attend. The state of Michigan is utilizing the big house as a vaccine site. So they didn't want the parking lot to be full of cars. They didn't want there to be a confusion about where to go for people scheduled to get their vaccine on that Saturday. It seems like signage is the thing that's been invented at some point. You just, you know, like vaccine, left arrow, football, right arrow, like go park it, park at Pioneer High School across the street. Mm -hmm. That is a thing that people do for football games all the time in Michigan, in fact. And uh, as far as why they didn't broadcast, quote, as I understand it, the Big Ten Network had set a certain time that all of the programs needed to say, hey, this is when we're going to have our last practice. And with the uncertainty of the pandemic, with the changing schedules, Michigan just wasn't able to meet that deadline because they had to move some things around and it just didn't work out. Um, as far as why they didn't have local media in attendance, uh, he had this to say. Close what? quote. All right. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but are you saying like, Angelique Singalis wouldn't like, oh, she got into the line for the vaccine? Like, yeah, no, the yeah, football? yeah. Like, yeah, they're worried that some of the reporters may have already had two vaccines. And then if they get a third, you know, accidentally get in the wrong line and get a third vaccine, like, oh, so shoot, now, now I'm now I'm the Hulk. Well, no, that's terror. That's can't have that. You can't you, Tony, you just can't take that kind of chance. And anyway, so that's why sometimes you have to treat state run media like they're just lying liars who lie, because sometimes they're going to frame things like that and, you know, tell you like very, very obvious lies about like, oh, no, 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 no. We really wanted to have fans come watch the mm -hmm. game, but we just we just couldn't work it out because signage is not doesn't exist, and there's only parking for uh, there's only parking for 17 cars around Michigan Stadium, and there's not a high school caddy corner or a golf course across the street or like it's I'm sorry, it's just it was just impossible to do. It's like mm, mm, I'm not sure that is a full and accurate representation of the truth. That is my takeaway there. And you think about it, this is a place that can probably handle like 35,000 cars in the area every Saturday, you know, seven Saturdays a year. Um, but, you know, with uh, several hundred people getting vaccines and a, uh, several thousand trying to go to the game, it just, you know, there's no way it was going to work out. It's, just, it's unfortunate. You know, I'm sure fans would have loved to have gone and watched whatever it was. But, you know, you just can't, you can't change these things. And, and there's, how do you provide, as you said, how do you even provide directions? Nobody knows where they're going, even though everybody that goes to the stuff has been there before and they know where they're going, including the media, especially the media. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're there regardless. And they're there more than the fans are. And so, um, yeah, when all of this is hidden, then you're just wondering, well, why and what are you hiding? And I bet it's not 
good. And I, you know, thinking like, you remember the A team? When uh, uh, do I remember the A team? <laughs> yes. Every, every episode, they would have to like build a vehicle or or uh, adjust a vehicle uh, in behind uh, behind the, the closed doors, and then they come out and it's got like metal sheeting on the van, and now it shoots two by fours out of a cannon and all of this stuff, and so maybe that's what's going on behind closed doors at, at Michigan, and pretty soon those doors are going to open. And we're going to see a van with metal sheeting that shoots two by fours and, you know, just, just runs roughshod through the big 10 and, and eventually, you know, stops that greedy land bear and trying to take the people's land. I, I thought for sure this was going to go with, it was like the A team because lots of people are shooting guns and no one ever gets hit. And that's kind of like the Michigan passing offense this year. A lot of lot of flanging of things all over the place, but no one no one ever gets hit, and so, you know, the the, the death total is zero until the season starts. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's very uh, very apt uh, observation, Tom. I think that'll do it. Do you have anything else I about Michigan that you would like to talk about? I, I have a lot of stuff about Michigan I'd like to talk about, but I feel like we've kind of rung the uh, rung the. Uh, rag dry with what we the information that we have right now so i have a feeling we'll you know that we will probably get a chance to talk about michigan's defense at some point too which is going to be a whole different adventure because again brand new coaching staff not a ton of talent in a bunch of places and uh that generally doesn't add up to super fantastic results but you know maybe hey after all after all we just talked about i think everyone's thinking well i'm sure the offense can carry them this year it'll be fine he's just i feel bad for daxton hill like he's he is tremendous talent, and then you got everything around him, and you're like, are you? I like, I'm surprised he has not transferred just because. Like, I, I but you know, credit to him for sticking it out, and um, maybe he can lead this defense to something, and and, uh, and we'll see, or, or maybe we won't. It'll be a while before we hear anything, of course. But yes, we will be talking Michigan more, and eventually, Tom will have to do our tale of the tape, which is always one of my favorite episodes where um, we tell you that, yes, Ohio State has more talent than Michigan at this position. And then we have a couple of people say, you guys are just homers. It's like, but have you, are you, have you seen, <laughs> are you aware? You know, they measure football teams by uh, wins and losses and scores, right? That's a thing that they do. Homers. All right. So that will do it. Uh, big day on uh, BuckeyeScoop.com today. It's a, uh, Four wise men, uh, Nevada Buck extravaganza on the Ask the Insiders message board. Recommend you check that out. We talked a little bit about it on Tuesday. Uh, we, we don't even need to go into it right now. Just just go check it out. You will. Um, there, there, there's so much stuff going on right now on the, the, the message board with an all-day chat with those guys. Uh, got draft, the NFL draft today, Justin Fields. I, I saw earlier in the week, Chris Sims uh, mocked. Mocked him to uh, 32 to Tampa Bay, Tom. Would you, uh, would that be a great spot for, for Justin Fields or what? You know, I mean, they have a uh, kind of broken down old quarterback now at Tampa Bay. So I think a, a young, uh, a young, fresh uh, starting guy down there would probably be good for them. Maybe have take one year to learn from uh, the, the old guy, um, make him wear your alma mater's jersey after your alma mater <laughs> beats his alma mater at the end of the year, as is, uh, as is tradition in the NFL. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that now, Spoiler, I don't think he's actually going to slide down to 32 because I'm not a stupid idiot. So, I mean, there's, there is, there is a stupid idiots around the NFL draft issue that I think still needs to get resolved a little bit. But uh, yeah, if, if Justin Fields ends up going to a, a winning team where, especially where he could sit for a year or half a year or something like that, that'd be fine. But I don't think he's going to slide down to 32. I'm, I'm blown away that you, uh, you're one of the rare people who apparently think Justin Fields is, can start in the NFL. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, he's, he has a few things you'd like to see in a quarterback, such as good leadership, intelligence, arm strength, accuracy, and such and such. Like name seventeen. <laughs> I think we need to. I think we need to wrap it up. So oh, okay, time's giving me the wrap up sign. All right, we got to go. By the wrap up sign, you mean literally telling you it's time to wrap it up. Again. We need to let we need to let the nice people get on with their wake. Yes, <laughs> get on with their wake. Are you listening to this? Week. Week, okay. sorry. All right, and it's it's been a long week, um, and a long wake. So condolences, but we do have to go. Probably not the best time to listen to this podcast, but we do appreciate your patronage. 
So uh, thank you all. And we will talk to you guys next week.